power projections in a hot war. The world's two biggest powers both stationing warships in the Middle East. What's behind the move? Exclusive video catching the head of a nonprofit boasting about an alleged illegal Chinese police outpost right in New York City. And he did it right in front of Mayor Eric Adams. Pink slips for top Communist Party officials. Who's the latest senior leader to get ousted by Beijing after former Foreign Minister Qin Gan lost his post? And over $21 billion in stock dumped by Chinese investors. They're now offloading American stocks and bonds at the fastest pace in four years. What's fueling the sell-off? What do you think? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. As the Israel-Hamas war rages on, big powers are growing their military presence in the Middle East. China stationed six warships there, including two missile destroyers. The U.S. also sent two carrier strike groups to the region as a message of deterrence. The Chinese warships belong to two task forces. One of them has been there on an escort mission for six months. The other three ships are there to replace them. But the old task force didn't return to China after handing over the mission to the new one. It's still lingering in the Middle East, saying it's staying to visit friendly countries, which is quite unusual. The two task forces exchanged missions on October 2nd, five days before the Israel-Hamas war broke out. But the ships have stayed in the region, visiting countries like Kuwait and Oman. China analyst Tang Jingyuan says the Chinese warships are there to send a signal that Beijing has influence in the region. He noted having a military presence there also is a show of support for countries close to Beijing and, in essence, it counters the U.S. presence there. The Middle East pumps half of the world's oil, and Beijing has been competing with the U.S. for influence in the region. Most recently, it brokered a peace deal between two deadly rivals, Iran and Saudi Arabia. The two resumed their diplomatic relations after cutting ties for seven years. Saudi Arabia has historically been a U.S. ally. It's the world's largest crude oil producer. But Washington's relations with Saudi hit a low point after President Biden criticized Saudis over the killing of a Saudi journalist. On the other hand, Beijing has been propping up Iran amid Western sanctions, buying its oil, sending it weapons. Beijing also has been supporting terrorist activities in the Middle East. Former Chinese Communist Party leaders had close ties with a late terrorist leader in the region. While reports say Beijing guided Palestine on how to wage conflict with the U.S. and Israel and provided it with weapons, money and training. A daring remark from the head of a New York nonprofit revealed in a Daily Caller exclusive video shows the chairman of the American Changla Association touting an alleged illegal Chinese police station right in Manhattan's Chinatown. He gave the speech during the organization's 24th anniversary banquet last year. In 2020, we collaborated with the Changla District Court to establish a so-called Changla Overseas Chinese Dispute Litigation Center. But there's more. Footage from the event shows New York Mayor Eric Adams was in the audience. The Changla Association bills itself as offering public services for overseas Chinese. Critics accuse it of acting as an arm for Beijing's repression. Chairman Lu Jianshun went on to explain that a counselor with a nonprofit had been invited to participate in launching an overseas network, adding he was also, quote, entrusted to set up the Fuzhou Police Department in the Tangla Association of America. Happy 24th anniversary. The mayor praised the association in a speech during the event. Though, according to the New York Post, sources say Adams didn't know about the police outpost at the time. Later, two Changla Association members were charged with acting as agents for Beijing and for crimes tied to the overseas police stations. Based on the unsealed complaint filed with the District Court of Eastern New York, the organization opened the police station under direction from China's primary domestic law enforcement agency, the Ministry of Public Security. The complaint also noted that the police outpost was one of 30 around the world as of January 2022. 
A message from Governor Gavin Newsom. California will always be a partner with China on climate issues. The governor started a week-long trip to China on Monday. NTD's David Lamb has more. California Governor Gavin Newsom visited Israel recently before heading to China. Newsom assured during his week-long trip to China that his state will always be a partner on climate issues no matter how the U.S. presidential election turns out. After I'm gone, I promise you, Democrat or Republican, you're going to have someone that's there for the long haul on these issues, that believes foundationally these issues. I want you to know, regardless of what happens nationally, subnationally, you have a partner in the state of California. Newsom's visit to University of Hong Kong on Monday comes as U.S.-China relations witnessed a sharp decline in recent years due to trade disputes, U.S. support for self-governing Taiwan, and other human rights concerns, among other issues. Before his China trip, he visited the Tel Aviv Saraski Medical Center in Israel on Friday, meeting with survivors, families, and others, including those from California impacted by the Israel-Hamas war. Newsom said, Despite the horror, what I saw and heard from the people of Israel was a profound sense of resilience, a commitment to community and common purpose, especially in these most difficult of times. According to Newsom's office, California is working to ship medical supplies to support humanitarian relief efforts in Israel and Gaza. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Beijing's top spy agency is flexing its muscles on a new court case. It's accusing a Chinese citizen of handing over secrets to the United States and says his case is being sent to trial in the southwest city of Chengdu. According to Chinese state media mouthpiece CCTV, the man worked for a defense institute in China. He was reportedly sent to an American university as a visiting academic in 2013. That's when Beijing says he began revealing Chinese state secrets to a U.S. intelligence officer. He was arrested in 2021. That comes after Beijing shared information about another case, where China sentenced a U.S. citizen to life in prison earlier this year for what it called spying. Retired senior intelligence officer Nicholas F. Tenyadis had this to say. This is their version of gearing up for either response or retaliation to all the, um, the accusations of Chinese espionage globally because it actually has become an issue. But that's not all for Chinese authorities. There have also detained three more people, this time on suspicion of bribery. One of them is a senior executive at media agency Group M, owned by British communications company WPP. The other two are former staff members of the company. Chinese leaders have pushed to boost foreign investment in China as its economy struggles. But foreign businesses have become more wary of operating inside China. Chinese police have raided the offices of several foreign consultancies and due diligence groups this year, including Bain & Company, Mints and Capvision. A warning from top officials, Chinese espionage is happening on an epic scale. The FBI director and four other intelligence leaders from the Five Eyes Alliance all sounding the alarm on CBS. They have never before appeared in an interview together. They're doing it now because of what they called the greatest espionage threat democracy has ever faced from China. Here's what they talked about. We have certainly seen instances where the Chinese government, in a variety of ways, working through proxies or other actors, have attempted to harass, intimidate, stalk, surveil, threaten uh, Chinese dissidents, Chinese Americans, uh, especially those who criticize uh, the CCP and the current regime. Ray emphasized the threat from the Chinese regime, saying there's no country that presents a broader, more comprehensive threat to the U.S. He added that there are over 2,000 active investigations related to the CCP's efforts to steal information, including Americans' personal data. Ray's comments come amid the war in the Middle East and potential involvement from China. Last week, the intelligence chiefs of the Five Eyes Alliance gathered in California. The members are the U.S., Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, known as the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Network. There, they made a joint call to confront, quote, the unprecedented threat China poses to innovation across the world, accusing China of stealing technology secrets and using artificial intelligence for hacking and spying 
against their nations. Now for some brief updates, is there a shakeup at the top levels of the Chinese Communist Party? China has officially removed its defense minister Li Shanfu from his post. His ouster comes after he disappeared from the public eye for about two months without a clear explanation. He is the second highest ranking official to be let go in the past three months. Before him, former foreign minister Qin Gan had his state councillor role taken away. No official explanation has been given for their removals. However, there are suspicions that Li was under investigation for corruption. As for Qing, rumors of an extramarital affair during his time as ambassador to the U.S. had circulated. But they're ousting the number of China's state councillors is now down to three. This comes just as China is set to host foreign defense officials at the Xiangshan Forum in Beijing. And speaking of the forum, the U.S. Defense Department is reportedly sending a delegation to the gathering. Over 90 countries and international organizations have also RSVP'd. The forum is scheduled for the end of October in Beijing. The U.S. also attended in 2019, when the event was last held in person. Zooming in on another trip, China's top diplomat Wang Yi is traveling to Washington this week. He's set to meet with Secretary of State Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. The visit is happening amid the Israel-Hamas war and rising tensions in the South China Sea and ahead of a proposed meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping in San Francisco next month. U.S. Treasury officials and their Chinese counterparts held the first meeting of a new working group. The panel was established last month with a focus on economic policies between the two superpowers. Is Beijing worried about its increasingly weakening currency? Chinese investors sold off over $21 billion of U.S. assets in August, the most in four years. This may be to defend its currency, the yuan, from further weakening against the U.S. dollar. But there was no direct confirmation from Chinese investors about their motives for selling U.S. securities. The yuan $2 exchange rate has come under recent pressure from slowing economic growth and capital outflow. China's currency has fallen 5.7 percent against the dollar this year. Next, a world-renowned musical display comes to the Big Apple. Culture-loving New Yorkers gathered at Lincoln Center on Sunday to witness Shin Yun Symphony Orchestra's first show of the year. The performance ended with a standing ovation and some audience members described it as a healing experience. Let's take a look. The return of the Shenyun Symphony Orchestra was met with a cheerful and welcoming audience in New York City. It was their first stop to Lincoln Center in four years. It calms my soul and we need that. It's beautiful. Very uplifting and uh, nourishing to the spirit. Orchestra is unbelievable. The composer, you could tell, is very talented. With the sound of a gong ringing through the hall, the orchestra kicked off the show with one of Shenyun's most acclaimed compositions. Salvation During End Times. The program included original music written by Shenyun performing arts' in-house composers, as well as Western classical favorites like Dvorak's From the New World and Finlandia. The orchestra also performed a well-known classical Chinese music piece called The Butterfly Lovers. Shenyun Symphony Orchestra draws inspiration from 5,000 years of Chinese civilization, bringing stories and legends to life. The music emphasized Asian culture, and it has, I felt like the history, so much history of our own lives and of other people's lives were represented in the room. I, I, I saw movies. It sounded like a movie soundtrack. I could just see things going on when I heard the music. It just lights me up. It's so gorgeous. The New York-based orchestra combines both Western and Eastern instruments, blending ancient Chinese instruments and melodies into a classical symphony orchestra. Audience members call the performance uplifting. It's very good energy. It's very positive. Uh, it makes you feel good when you're listening to it. And it's uh, like in today's times, it's very nice to have such a positive experience. Understanding that beauty is part of our heart and the essence of every human being is very much a traditional value. And things that elevate the spirit, like this music, uh, 
awaken us to our conscience and being better people. Xuanyun Performing Arts showcases classical Chinese dance, along with original music, aiming to revive traditional Chinese culture before communism. The company brings brand new performances every year. A new season of Xuanyun begins in December. Coming up, China is developing a new generation of nuclear-armed submarines, and they're expected to launch in just 10 years. Experts saying if realized, the fleet would prove a nightmare for the U.S. How should we read this, and what can Washington do? We spoke to General Robert Spaulding, retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General and author of War Without Rules, for more. His comments after the break, here on China in Focus. Welcome back to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A new generation of nuclear-armed submarines are in the works for Beijing, said to be quieter, faster, and harder to track. And China's goal is to get them ready in just 10 years. What could the fleet mean for the U.S.? We tap General Robert Spaulding, retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General and author of War Without Rules, for insight. General Spaulding, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be back on the show. Thank you. It's great to be back. As the Israel-Hamas war continues, China sent six warships into the Middle Eastern region, not exactly where the U.S. carriers are, but they are in the region. How should we read this? Is this a power projection move from the Chinese Communist Party? Well, if you go back to uh, Deng Xiaoping's time, he said, we're going to hide our capability and bide our time. You know, under Xi Jinping, China is no longer hiding its capability and biding its time. It's, you know, has a global economy. It's creating a global military to glow with that, go with that global economy. We are in the second Cold War, so we can um, expect that anywhere that U.S. forces operate around the world, we're going to begin to see Chinese forces operate and begin to, you know, demonstrate that they have the capability to match capability for capability and even in their own backyard over uh, the capability of the United States. In general, you mentioned a second Cold War, and we're seeing reports that China is near a breakthrough with nuclear-armed submarines with the capability to strike the U.S. This would be in about 10 years. They're using Russian tech. They're much quieter. How seriously should we take these reports? One of the, the key capabilities the United States has had over China is our, our uh, nuclear subs. You know, so as they increase their ability to be quieter and patrol beyond their shores, then we can expect that they are going to use those capabilities to put a pressure on the United States. And I think the thing that we have to be concerned about is, are they moving from a strategy of minimum deterrence, which is what they have been doing in the past, and to break out to something where they can have a first strike capability? And having a first strike capability, can they then use that first strike capability to um, you know, basically blackmail the United States? We are in a different uh, competition. This is a cold war. We still have Ukraine's war invasion ongoing. There's this Israel-Hamas war. There's tensions in the South China Sea with two collisions with the Philippines over the weekend. Can the U.S. handle all of these different fronts at, at once? The answer is no. They absolutely can't. Uh, if you go back to the first cold war, we didn't have the arrangement that we do now with all the different combatant commands. Um, and I, you know, every single combatant command that's around the, the various regions around the world are looking for resources. I think one of the things that we have to do is begin to prioritize where we're going to focus. And I think China ought to be that focus. And then we ought to recognize that China is using its proxies, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and others to begin to overstretch the U.S. capability to respond. We can't be everywhere at once. We just don't have the resources. Our allies and partners aren't kicking in additional resources. So we're in a Cold War. China's trying to basically bankrupt us. They're not trying to beat us military. They're trying to basically force us to not have the resources to continue to support our, mili our overextended military. So it sounds like if we go after the Chinese Communist Party, we would actually be solving these other chaoses around the world that we're seeing. Is that fair to say? Well, absolutely. They're supporting Russia with trade uh, from the U.S. They're supporting Iran, 
who's supporting Hamas with trade from the U.S. They're supporting all these countries that they're using to then create problems for national security problems for the United States. We have to recognize that it's more than just, you know, the military. It's economics and finance and trade. It's political warfare. It's psychological warfare. It's happening uh, in all dimensions. And we have to be much more strategic about how we prioritize and how we focus on and what we focus on in order to get through this very trying time. This is going to go on for a long time. And if we're not mustering our resources and thinking smartly about how we spend our money and, um, and deploy our military, then we are going to be overextended and we are going to face national bankruptcy. And on that note, how should the U.S. be leveraging the economic and military might now so that we don't get into that bleak scenario? And we basically bring back and focus our resources on nuclear deterrence. You know, these are the things that we message to China that we're, we find absolutely un unacceptable and we are willing to use our nuclear weapons for those reasons. That's what we communicated to the Soviet Union. That allowed us to divert money that we would have spent on conventional weapons into science and technology, into education, into building our economy and our product productivity. And I think we do these things essentially go back to the time of the first Cold War when we were decoupled economically uh, and financially from the Soviet Union, and we really relied on building the science and technology and manufacturing capability of the United States. We need to do that again. General Spalding, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That's all for today's China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. If you have any feedback on the show or have something you'd like to see us cover, send us an email at chinainfocusntd.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.